All righty, hammer on. I'm here with Aaron DeCastro. We are sitting... So this, this particular section is, is separate to box class, right? Yes, yes it is. So this is the upstairs section of box class. Obviously the entry is at the front. You just go through the stairway at the side. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so th this space here, so this is called Bliss. This is like a Pilates studio. Yes. So we just um, created Bliss not long ago and it's been subleased out by a client of mine. So that's starting next week on October 19. Wow. It's set to open, bro. Okay. And then um, I, I guess, you know, for people that uh, – and, and I'm going to pull the story right back, but let's, let's talk a little bit about Box Class because how I, I met you was obviously uh, we did uh, an in-house event mm -hmm. and, um, geez, it was, it was a big event, wasn't it? Yeah, it was crazy, man. <laughs> it, was, it was bigger than I imagined it to be. Yeah. Like I didn't really like envision it to be that big, but, man, the experience and you coming there, you making it what it is as well too with the commentating was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So it was a, a in-house boxing event. You guys ran like a like a like a challenge or something. Eight weeks or something, or ten weeks of training. Yeah. So what it's called? It's called Fight Camp. Mm -hmm. um, it's similar to your corporate fighter type of event. Yep. But um, I didn't want it to have that corporate type of feel. Yep. Because with that corporate type of feel, I feel it's still a little bit boring. Mm. So we did we did really want to take the true essence of actually boxing and the actual training to it and creating uh, an event that was quite spectacular when they came in. So it's not just that any type of amateur type of event. Yeah, sorry, I just got to just that down for you. So when you have that amateur type of event feel, it's um, very serious. Um, whereas this one, I still did want to taper it down where the fighters had fun, the coaches had fun, and the other gyms had fun as well too. Yep. And that was what, the, what we were trying to bring out of the day as well. Yep. Well, there's like, I think, you know, Probably, what, 800 people there or something? Yeah. Like <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to tell. It's so, Look, story is we are, we're actually going to cut it at 300 people. Oh, so, wow. like, I looked, but then when I started putting the chairs up, I'm like, man, we can actually fit a lot of people here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was just like, man, let's just let it roll. Obviously, let's just let it get as big as possible. We can manage it, obviously, on the day. Man, it was crazy. Yeah, people kept <laughs> rolling in. And, uh, yeah, the food trucks there. You had all this yep. stuff going on. It, yep. was, it was really good. Like, Thank it was, you, man. It was Thank a you. really well-run event. Thank you. And, um, and like, you know, the crowd was great. Absolutely. Thank you, know, you, man. We had no dramas whatsoever. Everybody was well-behaved. It was, yep. like, they were loud. They were supportive. And well, you, you, you know how it's like when you go to these events, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, from what your experience is, have you been to boxing amateur events or MMA events? Yeah. That's your experience, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and what's your take from that? Mate, I, as I said, the crowd was really well-behaved. You know, um, a lot of the time, and I, I guess, you know, um, there's an element of like, you know, the spirit of like what, what's meant to be going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when it's like, you know, at some amateur events, like teams can get really, um, there's a lot of animosity. Yes. yes. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as much as we can, we can take out the animosity, like, because at the end of the day, it's a fist fight, right? Yes, that's right. But we want people to uh, engage in the, in, the, in, the, in the spirit of the fist fight with the right intentions, right? That's it. That's like, it. yeah, you want to try and, yeah, when you're in there, you, you, you've got somebody trying to take your head off and you're trying to do the same to them. But then when all is said and done, like, there's always a lot of respect. Well, that's what it's about, right? Like, you don't come into a sport where you don't feel supported, you know what I mean? And this is the, this is the space that we're trying to create yeah. because people get turned off when they have their first fight or even if they just get hit in the face, mm. you know what I mean? So boxing itself can be a daunting type of sport. MMA can be a daunting type of sport. But if you're in a good community and a good supportive unit, then you know, you're, you're able to be yourself and you're able to keep going with the sport and just learn to love the sport for what it is, not just for the competition, but more so for the fitness aspect side of things and building new friendships with people. Mm. The, the connections you make with people is amazing as well too. And you have a sense of self-worth, right? Yeah. So that's, that's really what this event was about. It wasn't about um, just the fight itself. It was really about just building a really supportive community for this sport and making it fun, making it cool, and bro, putting that box class flavor to it. So that's why, that's why, like, obviously we ran the event because we really wanted um, people to feel what box class was about. Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. All right, I, I, I do want to ask you about box class, but we'll um, we'll sort of wind it all back for people. Um, so you're originally, or uh, well, the family's originally from from the Philippines, right? Correct. And then, do you know when when your parents made it over, or your grandparents made it over to Australia? Um, it would have been. So I'm 35 now. So they, it was two years just before I was born, so 37 years ago. Yeah, wow. Yeah, 37 years ago, my family made it over. I was born here. Yep. So, yeah. And you got any siblings, Aaron? Uh, older brother. He's 40 now. Oh, okay. So yeah, five years older. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, so uh, do you remember, like, when, in terms of growing up, right, like, what would be your earliest memory of growing up in Australia? Um, 
how do you put it? It's a lot different to what it is now. Like, like, like obviously with my kids and how they're growing up. Man, to be honest, I loved it. Like, you were playing out till the lights, obviously the, the, the light poles were out. Um, your parents wouldn't let you go inside to watch TV or anything like that. You're literally out on your bikes. You're hanging out with friends. So growing up for me, look, it was, it was fun, man. Yeah. It was fun. Which which area, what area did you grow up in? I grew up in Mount Druitt, St Mary's. Hey, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I was my, my Colton area. Sorry, Colton. We used to live in uh, St Clair. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, so just down the road over yeah. the bridge, basically. <laughs> basically. So uh, yeah, we lived in we lived in St Clair. Same thing. I was a cul-de-sac kid. Like yeah. there was a little cul- we were we were the corner house, and there was a little cul-de-sac, and I used yep. to play with the other kids there. Um, you know, ride the bikes, all that sort of stuff. Yep. End yep. up scratching scratching my legs and knees <laughs> and elbows and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what that's what life was like back then. Absolutely. And then, um, okay, so then school-wise, what school did you go to? Went to St. Dominic's College. Okay. So, so that was in Kingswood, Penrith. Kingswood. Yeah, Catholic school. Yeah. Yep. Old boys school. Yep. Um, yeah. Yep. And then, so what, what kind of a kid were you in school? What type of kid was I? Yeah, like what Look, would your teachers have said about you? Um, man, I'll, to be honest, for me, there wasn't really any structure in my life. Um, if I'm not going to go too deep into it. Like parents were divorced. Father, father left. Um, for me, I, I didn't have too much structure in my life, so I literally ran life obviously how I wanted it to be. But mm. school was fun because being in an all boys school, you had a lot of mates, and it was just boys. So yeah. boys will be boys. Yeah, you just want to hang out with the boys. It's all about the boys, and we kept the spirit of togetherness. Yeah. So that's what felt like home for me. That's what felt like family. Yeah. So, but we'd obviously do those things that we were running amok. You know what I mean? We weren't really obviously following going to school as much with jig school, do all those things that obviously growing up adolescents would do. Yep. But um, yeah, that's how it was like for me, man. And then, and then, um, so then academically, like what did you, what were, you, what were your grades uh, like? I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> great, man. I wasn't great. I didn't really focus on school. Like I said, the, the aspect of school was just for the social life. Yeah. But as for academically, man, I was horrible. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was trash, man. <laughs> did your teachers, um, you know, do you, did you ever get much like in trouble with a lot with your teachers and things like that? Yeah, look, I'd get suspended, um, suspended here and there, but like I wasn't, I was still quiet as well too. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too much in trouble. Okay, but like like I said, um, I wasn't really the there. Like I would, I would always miss school, I would jig school, and all that type of stuff. But we were still under the radar. Yeah, it wasn't bad. So, so when you guys were jigging school, what were you doing? <laughs> oh man, just your usual. You're hanging out at the shops, like what it is now. Like you know how it was growing up. Like yeah. you could catch a train everywhere you want to go. So you go to the city, Galaxy World. Go, yeah, Galaxy World. <laughs> When was, was Sega World <laughs> open back then? Yeah, yeah, Sega World was yep. open. Man, you'd have your Counter Strike bars, all that type yep. of stuff. Like, man, it was a lot different back then. Mm. So you'd still have fun when you jig as well, too. Yeah. Whereas I don't, I don't know what they do these days. What do kids do these days? Well, I, well, I, I feel <laughs> like all those places probably, you know, well, arcades are pretty much dead now. Yeah, yeah. Right, because it's not the same. Like, you know, you can you can get those games at home now. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Whereas, like, I remember like playing Street Fighter and all those types of yeah. arcade machines. You could literally stay there all day, right? Yeah. <laughs> it used to it used to be uh, sixty cents for one credit. Yes. And, and a buck for two for two, right? Yeah, it's crazy how yeah. cheap it was as and well. And then too. now it's like you go now they've all gone to the card system, right? So <laughs> you know when you go to like uh, kids parties and things like that, they give you a card and you look at how much like the games would be otherwise. It's like two dollars eighty a game. And what was it before? Like five dollars for like an hour or two hours at a CS bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but now, yeah, I think nowadays most because because you know you can you can do a lot of that stuff from home. Internet's gone good, gotten mm-hmm. good. You know, you don't really get those land parties and all yeah. that sort of stuff yeah. as much. Land anymore. parties fire up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. I, I had mates that. Yeah, we used to do that. I used to go to like they used to have like um, what do they call them like uh, it would be like these massive like you you know you bring your own computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you have like this massive land party with all these other yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. That's how it was like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so then okay, um, from 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 school, right? Like, did you have any idea what you wanted to do after school? To be honest, no, man. Um, like I grew up as a, I had no ambition, I had no dreams mm. for it. Um, in that sense, so I didn't know what I actually wanted to do. I I did go through um, uni to go through my bachelor's of sport and exercise science, but that sort of failed as well too. Like I did it for a year, I didn't like it. Mm. Um, what else, did, what else was my path? Um, I went straight just into factory work. Okay. And from there, it was a full-time job. So I got a full-time job straight away. And I just sort of stuck. I was stuck in that factory type of life. So I didn't really have an ambition when it came to that. So yep. I was stuck in there for a couple of years. What, what kind of factory work? 
Um, just pickpacking men. Okay. Just pickpacking. So like warehousing stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'd say a lot of like eighty percent of like growing up, like you'd, whoever you'd hang out with in that area would just literally go to factory work because that's what it paid good at the time. Mm. You're getting like your forty or fifty dollars an hour or whatever it was. Yeah. And a lot of people would just go for that just because of the money. Yeah. And that's all I thought really, just money. Yeah. And then, um, so with the sports and exercise science, like. So when you went when you went to uni, like you just didn't gel with that style of learning, or what was it that sort yeah, of turned look, you off? Yeah, look, I don't do well with um, organized learning. Yeah, that's just me. I don't do well with organized learning. Um, if I, for me, I'm more a physical type of learner. Yep. So if I'm on the job before I'm doing something, I'll learn it myself. I'll learn on the way. Yep. Type of thing. I just like to chuck myself into the deep end straight away. Whereas I don't like to think about things too much where it's organized type of learning. Or mm. if I'm forced to do it, then I'll hate it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So then, uh, how did you how did you then sort of work your way out of the factory stuff? Because it, it, it's very easy to get stuck in that environment, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you know the saying about five of your closest friends and what they're doing. Yep. So my friends at the time they sort of ventured off into doing personal training, and they're all in the fitness. One of my friends was doing rugby league at the time. A couple of them made first grade as well too. Yep. Um, one of the other ones started doing personal training in the city. Same thing, his cousin started doing it as well too. So a lot of them started venturing into personal training in the fitness industry mm. just because from our background, that's what we were all good at. We were all good at fitness. We were all good at sports and we felt that that, that would have translated into obviously what we love doing. Mm. Um, and so it was my friend that sort of gave me a run to say, uh, you know what, you're great at talking to people. You've got, um, you got a good personality. Why don't you come to personal training? And that was in the city yep. in King's Cross Fitness First. Okay. And that's when I sort of just decided to do personal training, man. I just uh, got my certificate and then I chucked myself into the deep end there. Yep. So then I, I guess one of the good things about like uh, that fitness first sort of environment is that it's very structured, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is very structured, but you still get thrown into the deep end where you're just sort of running your own business. Mm. So running your own business is a, is a different thing to say. Let's say it is structured, but you still got to sort it out yourself. Yep. I, I didn't figure it out. You still got to figure it out yourself. Yeah, so I guess, you know, what from when you think about it, right, like the fitness first element will help you in terms of like they give you, you've got like um, the paperwork, you know, all the forms and all that sort of stuff. You don't have to worry about any of that. No, not necessarily. Like um, they do give you a structure in the sense to, as to how to run a business. Like you need contracts. Um, they give you a bridging program where it's about one to eight weeks before you start paying rent. But then obviously during that one to eight weeks, you still got to figure it out. You still got to learn how to... Um, Attain clients, you still got to learn how to sell, you still got to look for people on the floor to, to become obviously a client as well too. So it's not necessarily as easy as people say, mm. you know what I mean? So, And so uh, are there any interesting stories, you know, when you're going through that first eight weeks where it's like, oh shit, I fucked this one up? Or <laughs> uh, look, you, you, do, you do fight some demons because you just don't know what you're doing. And at the time, how old was I? I was... Um, I was 21, I'm living in St. Mary's, so what I would have to do is I would have to catch the train from St. Mary's at 4am, go all the way to King's Cross Fitness first, stay there all day, finish at 8, 8.30, but then during that time from what, 5 o'clock that you get there, all the way to 8, 8.30, you got to figure it out yourself, like you don't, like you're just literally sitting in the gym trying to figure out how to get clients, mm. you know what I mean, and how do you, how do you get clients? Yeah. Like you don't you don't know these things, and and so no one take, takes you through like this is they, what they they, do look. Or? They only put you through an onboarding. Yeah. But the hardest thing about personal training is is the sales process and getting your own leads. Mm. And look, this is probably where I sort of fell in love with the process because you had to learn all of these things yourself. Yeah. And and this is where I feel like I am excelling at now as a thirty five year old as of and my time in the industry, whereas because I had to learn the process of selling and attaining leads and doing all these things myself on my own. Mm. Because if you're, just say you're thrown into the deep end straight away and like you said, you're fighting demons, you're like, how do I get clients? You've got rent to pay within the next eight weeks and yeah. you're stuck into a contract for a year. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? So, okay. yeah, you've got to figure it out yourself within the eight weeks. Yep. So then uh, what, were your, what were some of your favourite strategies? Like what did you come up with? Um, what I would do is I would listen to a lot of... Um, audio books on the way to the city so talking to people um how to how to make friends and deal with people that's del carnegie all this type of stuff how to build rapport with a lot of people so listening to those books on the way there i'd, I'd sort of build up some strategies of how to attain clients i think the best thing that worked for me was i would pretend i was cleaning the equipment 
next to them and I just start, started truck, started, start, tried to start a conversation with them. Yep. And then from there, that's, I mean, it's not so much funny or like any like funny stories or anything like that. That was my best giveaway about how to attain a client because you just pretty much start a conversation with them as you're cleaning and you'd see what they're doing, like what they're doing for their workout and then you just tell them to jump into a session with you. Yeah, wow. and that's how you. That's literally how I build my clients. Yeah. So I'd see a person jump onto the treadmill, grab the cleaning equipment straight away, start cleaning next to them, start a <laughs> conversation, ask how their day is, try to become their mate, and then next thing you know, bro, why don't we work out? All right, done. We're starting to work out. Yeah, cool. <laughs> that's that's look. I think that's a really uh, that that was a smart way to sort of come up with your own strategy because you know not everybody can be like the in your face kind of salesperson. Yeah, yeah. Some people, a lot of people, don't like that, right? Absolutely. And Absolutely, and and obviously, you know, when you you're trying to look for a way, because obviously at the start, it's also it's still like you you have this imposter syndrome, right? Because like you've been thrown into this opportunity, and then it's like you don't really know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. So then you feel like, oh fuck, how do I approach this guy? Uh, and then also at the same time, it's like, what if he says no? And then you get in yeah. your own head about, okay, shit, maybe this isn't for me. Yeah. Right. And it becomes really easy to then uh, throw in the towel to go and say, oh yeah, like this is too difficult, right? Absolutely. Um, I guess, you know, you, one of the things that I would say is like, um, especially in sales, right, you get, you get used to um, rejection. And, and, and when I say that, it's like not, not in a negative way. I think it's more like people often uh, take rejection very personally. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, when you take a step back and you think about rejection, it's, it's not ever really personal. No, not it, at all. It's always like, you know, okay, it's the wrong timing for that person. Perhaps they don't have money. Like there's all sorts of reasons why yep. those sorts of things don't uh, come to fruition, right? Like if you think about it, um, I don't know if you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you guys probably had like stats in terms of like how many people would you need to speak to to actually get one client? Yeah, look, they do throw stats out like that, but I'm not that type of person to, to go with the numbers like that. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say like um, when you say when um, failure or if they if they reject obviously what you do, yeah. I find it as a way just as to how I could talk to them better. Yeah. Um, and it's not a really about a money situation or anything like that as well too, is it? Are you saying the right words for them to become your client? Yeah. Or are you saying the right words for them to um, buy your product yep. per se as well too? Because generally 99% of the time they do have a problem and there needs to be a solution mm. and you have to be a problem to their solution because 99% of the time as well too, they'll find a way to actually buy your product or get what they want, mm. you know, because they're going to buy any piece of equipment or something that they like or whether it's shoes, whether it's clothing, they're going to want to buy that regardless anyway and they'll find a way to buy that. Yep. Whether they give you uh, uh, an objection and if they do give you an objection, you've got to be able to find the words to overcome these objections and it's all in the consult. Yep. You know, it's where you speak to them, how you find out more about the person as well too and in saying that, this is what 10 years have taught me, mm. that, like you said, it's not so much being about a pushy salesman, it's really you are trying to find out more things about the person um, and you're trying to dig about or dig and find out more things about the person so that you can attain the sale, but you're doing it in the right way. Yep. You're doing it in the right way because you're asking them the right questions. Um, there's a feeling, there's an emotion, there's a process to all of these things, right? Yep. And look, just like when you went into the fight camp as well too, this is what I was trying to convey to people, that there's a feeling, there's a process, there's an emotion about the day. And the build-up to this day, it all comes to this one day when you walk into the ring, mm. right? So these are things that I always take into account. It's not so much selling, it's just how I do my business and how I talk to people as well too, that you've got to be genuine with people when you first meet them because if you're not going to do good towards people or if you're coming across as just selling a product, then they're not going to really like you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because like there's so many different ways to approach sales, and it's like when when you when you talk the way that you're talking, it's like I can uh, hear those same things being uh, said in the car industry, right? When it comes, like I used to say to my my staff, it's like it's not necessarily that you're trying to sell something, you're trying to facilitate what they want to purchase. Yes, right. And you know, like when you're talking about the questions that you're asking, like we used to have like all these different acronyms mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to apply that you could you know you can talk about um, like without getting like ultra personal with somebody it's like understanding what are their requirements when it comes to okay how many family members do they have how many people are going to be sitting in the car that's right, right? so it, the same thing applies to okay well what's their current life situation that's right what that's are they right. trying to achieve are they here for the weight loss are they here to gain strength you know and then it's like you're you're asking those questions to work out what levers you can pull yes to the guy and say okay well i can help you with that because because really at the end of the day like you saying you being a car salesman they're there to buy a car yeah 
Like there's no there's no ifs or buts about it. They're at your they're at your place to buy a car, yep. or they're at your place to lose weight, or they're at whatever that product or business is to buy their product. Mm. And whatever levers or strings that you can pull um, will obviously attain the sale for you. Mm. And it's not a bad thing. It's really because they're there. You have a product that they want, and you just have to sell it the right way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In the packaging. Um, the other thing that I th- thought that was interesting that you uh, brought up was like when they give you an objection, it's not necessarily a, a no. It's a how do you now nav- navigate your way around it? And I used to say like if you're not getting the objections out, like I always uh, would say this is like the uh, – when you think about poker, right? Yep. You know, you got to put your cards on the table. Exactly. Right? Because exactly. at the end of the day, if, you ca- if, you don't, if both sides don't put the cards on the table, you can't facilitate a negotiation. That's right. Because somebody's still withholding information. Mm-hmm. And you could waste your time trying to go straight to the negotiation, and like, and and even buyers get this wrong, right? Like, if you're, if you're looking to purchase something, and you know, unless you actually have done all of your research and you've answered all of your questions about everything that needs to happen, you can't really go straight to talking about price. Like, price no, is really just all. a defensive mechanism to go and say, yeah, I'm not ready, right? And it doesn't matter what the price is because at the end of the day, you can you can still turn around and say, yeah, like the price is one thing, but I still need to go and talk to my wife or X, Y, and Z, right? Yep, and and yep. so these are the things that like I think. Every person, no matter what industry that you're selling in, you have to overcome and o- overcome these objections. And the only way you do that is by asking those hard questions, right? Absolutely. And like you said, price is um is not really the end. Like you know what I mean. So they should just be saying, "Where do I sign? Where do I start?" Because mm. you have let all your cards out on the table. There's nowhere to hide, and it's not so much you're being pushy about it. They have a need. They have a want, and they want to be there at a certain time and place, or they want it now. So what's stopping you from getting it? Mm. So if you do say you have to, if if you do say, oh, I got to ask my wife, you've asked the question of, does your wife support you already, or does your family support you? Mm. You know what I mean? You're asking these questions already that lead to the answer for them to say yes. Yeah. So it's not so much obviously pushing them against the wall. I'm not doing that. But what you've told me is, you've told me that you wanted a certain thing, you want to attain it by this time X Y Z, and I've told you how you got to do it. Now wh- whether you want to start or not is it's not my decision, it's your decision. But here's the, here it is on the table for you to have a look at. Now, how serious are you about doing what you want to do or attaining your goal or attaining this product that you want to buy? Mm. You know what I mean? So that's, um, that's how it is. That's how, that's how I see it. Yeah. And it's not pushy. I don't, I don't see it as pushy. I mean, you're not, you're not just saying bye-bye now. Yeah. You, you've, you've asked them the emotional questions. You've, you've um, asked them all the things that, that they want. And we're just obviously taking them to their de- destination. You know mm. what I mean? So uh, out of curiosity then, like um, your client base, you know, from when you think about like that initial first eight weeks, like how fast did it grow? Um, whereas in the gym client base yeah, after, like after the, the fight camp? Uh, no, no. Well, I want to go back to the fitness first thing. We'll okay. get, we'll get okay. to the, yeah. yeah we'll get um, to the, look, once uh, it's, it's, it's momentum, right? Once you start figuring out what are the right words to say and what are the right things to do, you build up, um, you build up the resilience, and you build up, you build up momentum. Mm. So it did, it did build up quite significantly. So from that first first week to the week one to week four, it built up quite significantly. I was doing, I was doing one two consults a day from that first two to two to four weeks, mm-hmm. and then after that, once I've started to nail the process of how to consult a client and pick up leads on the floor, attain leads from signing a client as well to in referrals then it grew quite significantly. Mm. So it went from one, two consults a week to, what, 30, 40? And then whether if you want to put percentage on it, like I'd, I would probably nail probably about 80% wow. of, of that percentage and getting your client base from one to 60 sessions, I got that within eight weeks yep. because I was heavily involved in the process of learning how to sell. Yep. And being a personal trainer isn't about knowing all your fitness and your programming, yes, it's great, but if you don't know how to sell, then you're not really going to survive in this industry. Yeah, you need to know all the process of, of being becoming the biggest salesman. Yeah, you know. So it, it's funny, I, you know. Um, I got a friend uh, who runs a a, a a martial arts studio. Shout out to Dave, uh, but he would also say he would always say to me, you know, Johnny, running a, a gym is like there's three components, and you only need two out of th- out of the three. So one of them is sales ability, 
The second thing is customer service. Absolutely. Right? And then the third thing is uh, technical ability. Yeah. Right? He nailed it. <laughs> and it's like, he you only it. need two out of the three. <laughs> you, you, you don't have to be the most technically sound person if you've got a good sales process and you and you offer uh, the customers good good quality service. That's right. That makes them want to keep coming back because that's your loyalty at the end of the day. Yes. Right? Um, so it, it's always interesting when you think about that because, you know, um, a, lo- a, lot of, a lot of people get it wrong. They think, oh, you know, I need to be the most technically proficient, but it's like, no you got to look at what is your what, – what, what section of the market are you trying to fill, right? Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, when you're working in fitness first, you've got a specific sort of demographic that you're trying to tailor your, your skill set to. Yep. Right? Yep. You don't need to be the most technical guy to get somebody to being, you know, um, the strong, strongest person in the world, right? But you need to be, have this enough of a skill set to uh, help them achieve their goals. Absolutely. But then if you make them feel good about themselves, you make them want to keep coming back and you always are able to fill up your pipeline yep. in terms of – you know, clients drop off because it's like, you know, it's almost like um, when you think about the, the business of uh, being a, a physio or a chiro, right? Reality is if you're a good physio or a chiro, you should end up with zero patients. <laughs> right? That's right. Because your goal is to get people um, back in, in, in action. Look, you're, you're good at your craft. That's n- there's no lie in that. Yeah. But like you said, if you have great um, customer service and you have great marketing and sales ability then you're always going to get that pipeline coming through but yeah. if you're just focused on technical ability and that's all you're good at then obviously where your customer where's the customer is going to come from yeah you know that's it yeah it's uh, it's, it's interesting you know i always find that to be really really interesting yeah. so how, how long did you end up spending um in that gym before moving on um would have been three years yep yeah three years and then what was next after that? um three years and then i went into a franchise with my with my friend, there was three of us. Okay. So we went into franchising. It was a franchise called EFM Health Clubs. So that's a small, it's a small personal training gym. Yep. And you would focus on semi-private group training. Okay. Yeah. So they'd come in. Um, they can come in at any time. So we would be open from five a.m. till nine thirty, ten thirty. That that mum that school drop off time. Yep. And then you'd reopen up again from about three four, and you'd finish around eight eight thirty. Mm. But you can come in at any time. The workout's set for you on the on the board yep. and you sort of have that personal training type of style okay and and what was that like like how did you find because obviously that that business is a very different business model to fitness first right yep so i guess for you when you sort of reflect on that like what a so that was a franchise and to be honest i didn't know what i was actually getting into i thought it was just cool that i would be owning my own type of semi-private studio type of thing mm. and that was horrible man it was a horrible experience it's not yeah. that it was a horrible experience it was I just didn't know what I was doing. And that's where a lot of growth came out as well too. Um, and working with a group of friends, look, don't get me wrong, it's cool working with a group of friends as well, but when there's too much too much chiefs, not enough Indians, it's harder to work because you sort of just rely on, the, on your friend to do a lot of work. I would do something, then my friend would be doing something, and then my friend would be doing the other part of work, but then we'd also rely on that work to just get done, mm. magically just get done, where there was no process of anything to get sorted did that strain the friendships no not at all not at all we're still really good friends now we just decided that it wasn't for us and at some stage obviously one of us had to leave yeah and and break up and do our own thing yep and we just work better in separate groups yeah to be honest but we were we learned a lot all together it was it's not that it was a horrible experience i'm saying a horrible experience in saying that I was broke for a long time. It was difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as for the experience with my friends, we didn't have any arguments or anything like that, but we grew significantly as business owners and entrepreneurs in that space for about two, three years. And Mm. this is where we learn the process of actually running a business and just wholeheartedly throwing yourself into the deep end and figuring it out, you know? You know, it's funny. um, I think, you know, when as we grow older, right, like we always have people providing us with advice. Right, and people will tell you, oh, you know, don't do this. Even if it's your parents, like I, I still yep. get that sort of advice from my mum. It's like, you know, don't do this, don't do that. It's like, mum, I'm a forty year old man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're still giving me advice. You're still giving me advice. Like, don't you think I would have worked some of this shit out by now? <laughs> but to her, you know, I'm always going to be her baby. Yeah, right? absolutely. And um, a lot of the times, you know, uh, it's almost like people suck the the confidence out of you to do things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's where it's like. Sometimes I think, you know, people that um, are very impulsive have a, a great strength to be able to just jump from one thing to the next. Yep. Because, like, when you think about, like, um, I don't know if you ever heard about this thing, but there's, like, this thing called the marshmallow challenge. No, I've and what they, what they do is, like, they get these groups of people and they'd give each group, say, um, I don't know, 20 sticks of spaghetti as an example and a marshmallow. 
And the goal of the of the um, of the task is to try and build the biggest structure that you can mm-hmm. for that marshmallow to, to sit the highest as possible. Okay. Okay. Right? And so then you know when they do this with um, with adults and when they do this with children, you get two very different outcomes. Because what happens is like um, the adults are there thinking, okay, uh, the strongest structure is the triangle. Yep. I need yep. to build as many triangles um, to get this thing as high as you're possible. Use, you're using marshmallows to, to build the structure or you're just using anything to build so the structure? Just, you, I think they give you like a little bit of sticky tape. Okay. Uh, okay. Some st- sticks of spaghetti, <laughs> like uncooked, uncooked spaghetti yeah, yeah. and one marshmallow. Okay, okay. And you okay. want to put the marshmallow as high as possible. Mm-hmm. Right, and so then you know, um, and the reason why I know about this thing is because I, I've, I've been through courses where I, I had yeah. to do it with a group, right? And so yeah, like when you do this with adults, like we're all there thinking, oh, you know, the, the guys with like some sort of uh, technical or engineering understanding, oh, we're yeah. gonna build more more triangles, you know, more triangles. Triangles yeah. are the yeah. strongest structure. We'll get more triangles. We'll get this thing as high as possible. And then it's like when you actually look at like um, uh, some of the structures that have been built the highest, they're actually done by kids. Oh, really? Yeah. Because kids don't think like that. They, and don't, they don't, think don't have about any foundation or background knowing well, structure. See, what kids do is they just go trial and error. Mm-hmm. They start with the end goal in mind, which is okay. I'm going to put a sticker. Sp- I'm going to put the marshmallow on the end of that sticker spaghetti. Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't stand. Yeah. If we've only one strand. Okay, put another stick in it. Let's try something else. And then they ke- they just keep adding sticks to it until they get like this structure that like it doesn't look the prettiest. Yep. Yep. But it's functional in terms of achieving the task. And you got they they got it right, right? Well, it's like they built it the highest. Yeah. Right, and so you know, there's there's something to that in that, like you know, as we get older, like as kids, because you don't know, you try you try as many things as possible, and then when you get something that sticks, you you stick with it. Mm-hmm. But as adults, like because we've been educated to believe that there there is a right way and a wrong way, yeah, you second guess yourself. Absolutely, right. And so it's like you you think you know better, so then it's like okay, well I'm gonna wait, and and they call it analysis paralysis. You yeah, know, like you yeah. sit there and you keep thinking about things without ever jumping in and just doing it. Yeah, and like yeah, your experience there, you know, jumping into that business. Is, is one of those ones where it's like, okay, because you've jumped in, you have a real opportunity to learn. Because yeah, everything else before that was theoretical. Yes. Right? Yeah. Now you jump in and it's like, oh shit, we don't know much about this. Yeah. We don't yeah. know much about that. You've got to you learn You just this. have to figure it out yourself. You'll learn that. Right? Yeah. So um, do, you find, do you find when you think back on that, like that's actually, you know, it's a pretty powerful thing, right? It is powerful now that you say it. With that strategy, that's how I base all of my business. I just jump into it without even knowing. Um, and a lot of people do procrastinate and they do stay in that analysis versus paralysis type of feeling mm. and I don't think that's a good place to stay in because you're never going to get it done yep. you know, and if you never try different bits and pieces in your business then you're never going to succeed um, and I wouldn't even call it successful you're just actually having a go mm. and if you have that mentality of like you said being a child and just opening up with a clean slate and continuing to try then you build a sort of you build calluses and you build um you build more self-confidence within yourself just to keep going. Mm. And how hard is it opening up your own business? You know, so it's very, very hard. People will open up their own business and then some people will close within the first one, two years. But if you just keep going and you keep trying new things and you keep, keep coming with that mentality of, I just gonna, I'm just going to continue to try, I'm just going to conti- keep continuing to go because I've got that vision in mind and that's the only thing that I see, then that's, to me that's probably the best way to go. Mm. Because if you're, if you're just looking at X, Y, Z, okay, what happens if something happens here? Um, okay, this looks like this, but then, you know what I mean? Like, you, you're just staying there. You're yeah. not really getting any work done, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's just the way I see things. Well, it's also, uh, I, I, I would liken it to when you think about, like, a boat going through water, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's, there's multiple factors that are in play. You know, there's the wind. Yep. Right? That can blow you off course. There's the current, the water current underneath <laughs> yeah. you. Right? That can also take you off course. Yeah. But if you so the point is is that if you don't have any forward momentum in that boat, you're just following wherever the the, w- the wind and the water takes you. Yeah. Yep. Right. But if you've got a destination that you want to get to, well, you need to start. You need to get the engines going. Yes. Right. You can always course correct. Yes, that's right. right? Once you start moving, it's like oh shit. Okay, maybe I need to angle a little bit this way. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. To sort of correct course correct. But if you never if you never started moving, all all you're doing is you're just drifting in the wind. Right. That's right. There's that's no right. structure. There's no goals. There's no um, destination. Absolutely. But at least you have a, have a destination. You can always course correct to how you want to get there, right? So, um, I guess um, you know uh, when you think back on the the time at EFM, like uh, what would be some of the biggest learnings for you as a business owner? Um, the biggest learnings for me, it was it was a sales process of things because what we were, what our place was at the time. So it was in. It was in ride. It was a ride rehab facility. So our place looked how it looked 
was horrible. Really? Yeah, it was an old rehab facility. The place was a gym, but it was a pool. Mm. So there was carpet inside the pool and it would it would angle down like this. So you'd literally it would literally be an old hydro pool. Oh wow. With tiles and and fences around here. There'd be equipment on the bottom and then we'd obviously run equipment on the ro- on the side of the the pool as well too. Yeah. And this was our actual gym. This was our product. Wow. So the the lessons that I learned there was the big lessons is is like we needed to s- learn how to sell a product. It didn't matter how the place actually looked. We just needed to learn how to sell and be really good trainers and give them ex- an experience inside these facilities, <laughs> no matter how hard it like bad it looked. Yeah, <laughs> like you'd walk in there and you'd be like, "What is this place? It's an old pool." Yeah, wow. Like, how are you supposed to sell in that? Yeah, you know what I mean. So did you guys um try and dress it up a little or like? Make some changes to how it looked. No, no, really. really. We were like, we were we were twenty, twenty three, twenty four. So like, I, we didn't even have any money as well, too. <laughs> so like, we put all our eggs into one basket, just just buying the actual franchise and the and the clientele base, mm. and we just rolled with it. So how how many clients came across when you? Uh, when we first came across, so so what happened was I was the first person to open up that club from us on that day. Okay, and we just purchased the. We just purchased the franchise off him yeah. and the franchisee didn't tell him they were actually leaving. So once we purchased the product, we got handed over the keys. The members and clients didn't weren't, weren't aware that they were going to get a new gym, uh, new trainers yep. or new franchisors. Yep. So that was a really daunting experience because I like I would be opening up the doors to people that I actually don't know. So I'd have to tell them the story as to what happened. And he was painted as a... As a great trainer, great guy, but obviously it fell down behind the scenes. He wanted to let go of the actual product itself. So we had to come in and we had to come in as new trainers, new franchisors and just turn it around somehow. Wow. So how, what was that experience like? You know, your first day you open up the doors, you got these people that want to train and they're like, who are you? Well, same same thing as I approach life in general and business is just you got thrown into this deep and you're just going to have to figure it out, to be honest. <laughs> did, you, did you pull out the spray bottle you're and start, start cleaning? <laughs> <laughs> I start like, spraying as soon as I get in. Go back, go back to old yeah. habits. <laughs> <laughs> as the entry comes in, I start spraying. Welcome, welcome. Um, look. It's if you have faith and you have trust in who you are and your abilities, as in your people skills and making people comfortable, then everything will be okay. Mm. Um, no matter how hard everything is around you, or no matter what problems are um, before the gym or whatever's happened, if you have faith in your ability and skills to turn something around, then you'll be okay. So whether whether the conversations had to you had to strike up different conversations with these people to make friends with people. That was something that I had a lot of faith in myself to, to help build the gym and to turn it around to, for them to obviously turn into our model and turn into us as trainers rather than obviously mm-hmm. take into the back learning of the other previous trainer. Mm. So that, that's really what it is. It's just running off faith in who you are and what you believe in. Out of curiosity, um, and this, this might be you know digressing a little bit, but where do you think that strong... Uh, sense of identity for you comes from um that's a good question i've never actually really got that got asked that question um look my my old man left when i was young yeah so when i when i say like when i was old? young i was 12 years old okay so 12 years old that's when i i had to be a man you know so at that time at that place in my life i had to grow up to be a man i had to figure it out myself so in saying that it's I had to build a strong identity. I had to build this type of resilience because I was on my own. My mm. brother took the role of being a, my, a father figure, but still, he was young as well too. He was 18. He yeah. still didn't know what he was doing as well. Mm. But as for him being 18, he had to take on the load as being a parent. Not so much being a parent, but take on the load as financially. My mother had the financial load as well too. I don't know. Like a, where We come from both Asian backgrounds, as we were speaking before. Mm. In that, in that time, in that place in our life, all they had to do was work. Yep. They were working two jobs. They were never home. So you didn't really have a process or a how – do, how do you say? You didn't really have a process of how to become a man mm. or how to become someone that you need to be or anyone to fall back on. You know, yeah. I only had myself to fall back on. So that's why I always have to back myself 100% no matter what the situation is. Mm. Uh, there's two things that I want to ask you. Um, 
I guess, you know, going to a Catholic school and all that sort of stuff. Uh, did you ever, like, I guess, do you, do, you, do you believe there's a God? Do you have a relationship with God nowadays? I do. I do. Um, it's not so much before I didn't have a belief in God. We come from a re- religious background. Yep. Um, my mum is a pastor, not a pastor. She was, we, she was a Eucharistic minister, minister at our church, so we'd have to go there regularly every Sunday. Yeah. But as for learning and, and learning the process of getting closer to God, that was hard as well too for me yep. to understand. That was very hard because you, we had a lot of um, not so much problems in our life. There was things in our life where you'd ask, why is this happening? Yeah. And that's where I, it's not so much I didn't have faith in God at the time. It's just I was always asking a lot of questions as to why is this happening in my life? Yeah. And in asking those questions, you'd see that there is a God because if you're asking the questions as to why this is happening, things around you will still be okay. Mm. Um, if you have a positive attitude towards everything, if you, do, if you still do good towards people or if you still have a good attitude towards everything, things are still going to be okay. Mm. You have a good string of luck as well too that come your way. And there were times when I was doing bad things. I was stuck in the drug Drug, um, taking drugs when I was younger. I was stuck into partying. I was stuck into doing the wrong things. And that's where the string of bad luck came. Mm. And you do notice that if you're going into the wrong direction, bad things come your way. Mm. And there comes to a point in your life as well too where you think, okay, you ask the question again, why is my life like this? And then there becomes a sign to say, okay, X, Y, Z, you've got to start going back to that path of, of going on, a go- on, on doing good things good things towards people, following the structure of being grateful for what you have in this moment in time. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't like to really sit in the negatives for a very long, to- long time. Mm-hmm. I don't like to... Um, look, I'm grateful for my background and how I grew up, but I also don't hold on to that as well too because there's always a future and there's always something ahead of you. And the more that you hold into your past, it still stays into your present and your future. That's it. Yeah. And it becomes all it becomes is resentment, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I did notice I did notice that coming into my life a lot when I when I was holding holding the past, holding a lot of resentment towards how I grew up and the place I was in. And look, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling, and it's not a good feeling for the people around you as well too. Mm. And God bless my wife as well too, because she's put up with a lot of um, a lot of my shit. Yeah, <laughs> but. Look, I wouldn't be the man I am or I wouldn't be where I am today without my wife. Like, God bless her. I love her so much. Um, I've learned a lot from her and she's turned me into the man I am today as well too because she she has steered me into the right direction of accepting me for who I am and still still telling me there's still wrongs in who you are as a person, but you can fix it, mm. you know? So God bless God bless my wife. I love her so much, Dilly. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's sad. Fuck. Um, well, uh, yeah, like the resentment thing, uh, I, I definitely know how, you know, um, that feels, right? Like there was a, uh, there was a, I had a fractured relationship with my dad for a, a quite a period of time in my um, teenage years. And I, I blamed him for a lot of things that went, mm-hmm. you know, he, he did the wrong thing by my mom and I blame him for that. Obviously, that was his volition, right? Yep. Um, but you, you, I think there comes a point where you realise that the only person that it's hurting by holding on to it is yourself. Absolutely. Right? And so... You know, like hearing you talk about it, like a, it resonates for me. You know, just because I, I know what that feels like. Yep, yep. But then it's like when you, the moment you just, it's like almost like a, it's night and day between when you, the moment where you decide you're going to let it go, and it just feels like it's actually a load off your own shoulders. Yep. Right, and then it's like, okay, wow, like why was I holding on to this? Yeah, man. Look, it's very, very hard, and and here's another story to come up with. I don't know if your father's still alive now. Is he still alive? He is, yep. Okay, so when my father left when I was 12, I didn't really have a relationship with him either. Yeah. Like I was saying, and I didn't want a bar of him. Even when my son was born and my children were born, I didn't want him to see them. Yep. And, and that's how I kept it. And we've never had a really good relationship since he left because I held a lot of resentment. I didn't like who he was as a person. I didn't like how I grew up. But in saying that, those, those things that I've held inside was pouring onto my family as well too. Yeah. And what it is, was last year. So last year my father passed away and I still never forget, forgave him for obviously what he'd done. And it was at that moment and in that time where I had to look at myself and say, was that really worth it? Mm. You know, was that really worth 
the the years of hate, you know, the years of resentment. Mm. Because in that time, in saying, there's nothing more important than family, right? Yeah. There's nothing absolutely more important than family. And now that you actually have a family, you have a family, I have a family, you can really feel that in that moment, in that time, and if you look at the reasons why things happened, that was the resources that they had. You know, and there was nothing really that they could do about it. Yeah. And if you never ask the questions as to why he did the things he did, or if you ask your father, why did you do this? Then you will re- never really know. All you will do is you will just resent the person for who they are. Yeah. But if you find out the background story as to, number one, how did they grow up? You know, um, what was their problems that they were facing? You know, and then having a family is hard as well too. Yeah. Having a family is hard having family, wife, kids, then obviously throwing work into the mix. This stuff is hard, yeah. you know, and if you don't ask the questions instead of just having the resentment towards them, like you're never going to know. That's it. You know, yeah. and if you don't search for these things as well too, you're never going to know. All you do is you just leave hate inside you. Yeah. You leave resentment and that's not a good thing to hold, man. Yeah. yeah. You got you to understand, like, as, as difficult as it sounds, right, you know, um, it's like you got to try and almost put yourself in their shoes to try and understand why they made the decisions that they made. And it's not to say that, you know, um, everybody makes mistakes. We're all fallible. Yes, absolutely. Right? And so sometimes people just make mistakes at the same time. And that, that's that's how I approach it too. Like one of the things that I'm, I'm grateful for is that, you know, um, when I started this whole podcast project, one of the ones what I wanted to do was actually sit down with my dad. Yep. And I did that, you know. Like oh, you that did was, that? Yeah, that was episode three. Oh, wow, man. And that would have been very him. confronting for you as well too, right? Well, we didn't really necessarily go into some of like the, the really difficult stuff. Mm-hmm. But like at least I could really understand, you know, um, the story behind, you know, what his life was like growing up. Yep, yep. You know, what was life like when um, my brother was born? Like these sorts of questions. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, that's for me, that's that's what I cherish, you know. Like I think thinking back, you know, it, it's a weird thing, right? Because, and, you know, like when I think about memories, right, um, it's one of those ones where it's like your brain will always gravitate to um, the extremes. There'll either be extreme moments of happiness or extreme moments of sadness. Yep. but the normal times in between, you yes. don't really remember. Yeah, you don't feel that. Yeah, right? So, you know, I sort of sometimes will lie, like lay, lay there or sit there and I'll, I'll just try and reflect on it and try and think back on like what are some of the happiest times, you know, with him that I can think of or, you know, with my parents. And, uh, and I, I, try and, I try and think about those things because those memories are, are in there. It's just like, yeah. you know, like I, sometimes you struggle to pull them out. Yeah, but why, why wouldn't we as people sit down and ponder about the good times you had with someone so close and dear to your heart. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's we sit here, we keep going with our days, we 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 feel like robots, you know. We yeah. we wake up, we do the same old routines, we do the same old habits, but I mean, have you ever just sat there and just thought, you know, what type of relationship that I have with my dad? What do I remember? Oh, and then then you sit back and then you take a look at you look at your kids. You would you'd like them to think about the same things, right? Yeah. You like they're not going to remember you going to work. Yeah. They're not going to remember you going to the gym for two hours a day as well, too. Yeah. You know they may they may look at you and remember you as a strong human being going to the gym every day, but I mean you if, as for giving them time and effort, mm. you know that's what I look at now, um, and that's why I created a, a business for myself so I can spend time with my family and kids. I don't want that nine to five type of feeling where I'm working around someone else's schedule. Mm. This is my schedule. This is how I feel. This is how I want to do things. And you don't want your kids to feel like they're competing with what you're doing. Yeah. Right? Because I think that's the that's the biggest um, trap. Because I think as dads, like, we have this pressure on us to feel like we're providing for our family. Yep. Right? And But there's a point of diminishing returns. Like when is enough enough? And I, I think a lot of guys don't really think about, you know, when is enough enough because we always want more. You know, and we want more, we want more. And then what happens, what's the trade-off for that more? You know, the trade-off is more time or more, time. more this, more that. Yep. And then you get that more, but when is enough enough? Exactly. And then by that stage, it's like, okay, maybe by the time you've had enough, your kid's already grown and they've left, left the household. It's not even about your kids as well too. You've got to think about your relationship with your wife yeah. as well too. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at all these things like, is it worth it? Mm. Is it? Is it worth all the time that you wasted as well too? But it depends on the person, like what's more important to them, what's their priority. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to. And well, everyone's going to find a way to, to that, work around that. That's a tough one because I, I feel like nowadays everybody's funneled, funneled down this specific pathway. <laughs> right? Like everybody's funneled into this life where it's like, okay, yeah, you go to school, you 
do whatever, then you get a job, and then you get a, you want you need to have a career, or you need yep. to have this, you need to have that, and then you know for a lot of people, yeah, like I, I used to call them industry statistics, you know, guys that you know spend all their time at their job, and then they'd suffer a, a marriage breakdown or, or separation or these sorts of things because they spend all their time at work. And also, they're not they're not willing to work through whatever the relationship is that they're going through, or whatever the problems is as well. Mm. You know, so if you're not working through the problems, if you just decide to walk away because that's what you're used to, then that's a that's a that's a you problem. Yeah, and that's something that you have to fix. There's a there's a great analogy that I was um listening to, uh, this this lady talk about, and I was like um there there are different types of relationships, obviously, that you have you know uh, with a significant other as you as you're growing up and in life, right? And she would define them or delineate between the two of them. Like you'd have a cornerstone relationship. So that's a relationship where you grow with, through something with this other person and it, and it becomes a, a piece of who you are. And then there are relationships that if you're an older person and you're, you're more set in your ways, mm-hmm. they're more like what they call capstone relationships. Yep. It's just like the end piece, but you, the structure's already built. And it's like the, the difficult thing for any uh, relationship to survive is that if you're building... Uh, if, you, if the structure is still being built in terms of who you are as a person, because of the changes that you go through, a lot of relationships can fail at those points mm-hmm. because the cornerstone's missing. Yep. Right? But it's also a choice to decide, well, can I grow with that other person and can they grow with me as well? It's a choice, yes. It's a choice, right? And it's really easy. Like, I feel like, you know, we make it really easy nowadays to just be able to turn our backs on a relationship yeah. and say, yeah, that's it. But And it also, it also strings down to the support as well too you have. Mm. The support... Um, and and your significant other, mm. are they pushing you to say, let's make this work out, yeah. or let's 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 get like let's make it all work? Because if you're if you're willing to just walk away, then you're not really looking to grow as a person as well too. Mm. That's how I see it. Yeah. So I guess um, you know, after the after the the, the franchising experience, so what what did you move into then? Um, I went back into I got I, I got over the gym. To be honest, man, I, I moved back into warehousing, and okay. I wanted to just be on autopilot for a little bit. Yeah, because with as as You've with a lot out. of yeah, <laughs> as with a lot of social social interactions, you really get burnt out, man. Mm. You do really get burnt out, and and being young, you don't know how to switch off mm. as well. So, in that moment, in that life, so after that three year mark, I decided just to to go back into warehousing and be autopilot, and. That wasn't really a good place for me to be in as well too, because I was I was still wondering why I'm unhappy as well. Yeah. So when I was on autopilot, I was I was work, going to work every day like sad, unhappy. Yeah. I didn't like what I was doing. I hated it, and yeah, that's just the place I was at for that time being. Mm. But it's also, I think sometimes it serves a purpose to like be able to do something monotonous, and and like you know especially if you're burnt out, right? Yeah. You, you almost need that. You need that for a short period of time. Absolutely. To, to sort of recuperate yourself and then you can move on to the next thing. But if you if you get stuck there, then you can actually become more bitter and twisted about it because yeah. it's like, fuck my life kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. You, but then again, as with the person, you have to choose whether if you want to stay there or not. And that was another decision that I made. It's just like, man, I'm unhappy here. It's the same thing every day. I know what I'm actually good at. Just chuck yourself back into the deep end, apply for a couple of roles here and there and then you'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what happened? That's what happened, man. Um, I actually applied for personal training roles just because I wanted to stay local. I didn't want to travel to all the way to Gladesville or the city area. Um, I applied for a place up in Rudy Hill, so just to be a personal trainer. And I was too – I had a, I had better credentials than everyone else, so I, they ended up giving me the manager role there. Nice. Um, and, and this is where I actually found my true passion, to be honest. I found true passion in, in developing personal trainers – and helping them build their businesses up, helping them, helping them excel as personal trainers at a quick rate. Mm. Um, that's where I found mm. out that I was really good at helping people within this industry crack the market because it only they're only here for about a year. The lifespan of the a- actual PT or personal trainer in the fitness industry is only about a year. Really? Year long, yeah. They just because they struggle to make ends meet. They struggle they to make ends meet, and they're just points. not mentally resilient enough. Yeah. You know, so and they same thing. They don't. They focus on analysis over paralysis, and they don't just go ahead and do what the actual nuts and bolts are of the actual thing. And it's sales, leads, and marketing. That's yeah. what you have to really knuckle down into. Yeah, yeah. Is that, that you know in sport we say it, it, it'd be um, they're focusing on the scoreboard. They're not focusing on 
I'm playing the game. Yeah, right? yeah. So it's like if you, you know, if all the NRL grand final final was only a week, or just on the weekend. So yeah. it's like one of those ones where it's like you can spend all your time looking at the scoreboard or you can focus on making the plays. Absolutely. Right? And it's not even like this year's grand final. Look at last year's grand final where Nathan Cleary like just shot out of the woodworks at the second half. Yeah. Like they... Ezra scored three tries in a row and they were up by how many, however, so, however so many points and you had this greatness of, of a person, Nathan Cleary, <laughs> run out of the woodworks and actually shift them out the park and yeah. they ended up winning the grand final. Rising to the occasion. Yeah. And look at it now, they're four pit in this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> it's funny because, you know, growing up like at, at West is like... Panthers were nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, they they did have the same development structure. The juniors, yeah. like a lot of my friends in the in Saint Dominic's, like their their junior rugby league was amazing. Mm. And but the thing is, they let go of the junior rugby league talent. Mm. And now you can see it now because when Gus came in, he fixed it up, and they focused on the junior rugby league talent, and they shifted them off onto, onto the yeah yep. first grade. Yep. Whereas before they'd people would poach the, the talent from the juniors and yep. they'd shift off to other clubs. Yeah. 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 So I guess it's interesting that you, you sort of worked out that you've got like this, this passion for growing people because I think there's a very different skill set in being uh, an employee, so to speak, and then being a manager. And it's funny because like there's, there's so many parallels to the automotive industry because oftentimes like your best salesperson then ends up getting put into the management role. But it's like their focus, you know, your focus as an employee is very different. As you said, it's focus, being focused on the tasks, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You've got to be focused on your lead generation, your, 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 how many people you speak to, your connections, all that sort of stuff. And the problem that a lot of guys face when they first um, become a manager is that they're still focusing on those things when now their job is actually to coach and develop yep. their people to be able to do that. Because it's like it's the strength of many versus the strength of one. So you as one person, you could be a, a really great salesperson or really great PT that can manage your process and have 60 clients a week or 60 sessions a week. But then now it's about, as a manager, it's like I need to have 10 guys doing that for me to make what I'm supposed to be making. And if anything, right. if you don't have your 10 guys doing that, you're probably, you're probably taking a pay cut as a yeah. manager versus just doing it yourself. That's right. Right? That's right. So uh, I'm, I'm just kind of curious about like how you manage to switch that mindset because I feel like a lot of guys struggle with that. Um, Especially if they're, you know, they, uh, unless you're starting to like, you know, were you still listening to audio books and podcasts? Did you start investing like your energy into different things or reading different things? Um, not so much. It's funny that you say that because like you say, managers sort of focus on KPIs and the numbers and all that type of stuff. Whereas I never really looked at the numbers and I still don't even look at numbers to this day at my gym, to be honest. I always just focus on one, not one thing. I focus on certain things, which is um, community, bringing the, not so much the, the members or anything together, I try to bring and keep my crew as cohesive as, um, cohesive as possible, having this um, environment where they love coming to this place and they enjoy it mm. and they will create that same experience towards that to my potential clients and members. Um, I always look at it from a perspective of how, how, I, how I grew up as well too. Um, people want to feel like, they're, like they're, they belong to a place. And if you feel like you belong to a place and you feel like you are a part of something, uh, the, the person's going to do well mm. or the person is going to thrive in this, in this atmosphere that they're at. And I, I'm all about team. I'm all about bringing people together. I'm all about helping individuals thrive in their environment as well too. And that's one thing I always did focus on. I didn't focus on anything else but that. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, how long did you stay in that capacity? And I guess, you know, when when did this all start coming together? Um, so I I actually got offered another job as well too. So that was at UFC. Yep. So UFC, UFC gym, gym. That's yep. where I met Sam. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so I met Sam there in UFC as well. So um, I got reached. One of the boys reached out to me to become like a assistant manager there. Yep. So I, at the time, I just had a look at this was UFC at Weather Park. This is first when UFC got built, the actual franchise mm. before it started going. Downhill yeah. pear shaped. Um, I got asked to to step in as a assistant manager, mm-hmm. and at first I I was like, man, this is going to be too much for me. I'm trying to manage one place at the time, and then I'd have to part time manage this place as well too at the same time. Um, but I looked at the space. I I for me, I liked the space for what it was. I could see that there was potential there as well too. Mm-hmm. But as to figuring out how I was going to do it all was another 
was another problem that I'd have to deal with. But I, in saying that, like I said, I just threw myself in the deep and I just said, yep, and I'd figure it out as I go. Um, managing both places was hard because I'd be there at, at this other place from 9 to 5 and then um, in the afternoon I would be at this other place as well too from 5 all the way till 10. Wow. So those were, the ans- those were the hours that I sort of gave. But then I told them I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I told them that they're going to have to offer me a full-time job within the first three months. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go. Yeah. And knowing that, once again, I just focused on the process of watching all of the trainers first, looking at their personality. In saying that, in saying about the analysis versus paralysis type of thing, I do analyze people, but I put it into action straight away. So I look at number one. I look at how how their how their personality is. I look at how they deal with people. I look at their body language. And I look at how they are when you leave them on a loose, loose type of leash. Like you give them, you give them um, instructions, but then you also see how they react when you give them the, the instructions. Or if you give them certain set of instructions, how they conduct themselves as people when you're not watching them. Yeah. But I would, I would be watching them. Mm. You know. So that was the process of how I develop people. I would look at people, and I would analyze all of these things, and I would. I would give them um, advice. I would. It's not so much criticism. I just told them obviously what they needed to work on, and I'd work with them for a very long time doing that. And once I built the trust, once they started doing all of these things right, once they started building their client base, then they I built that trust with them, and that was already something that they, you know, we felt close. We were like friends already. So yeah. I did. I did build a friendship with a lot of people, but then I also did feel that you know building friends with people as well too and getting that close sometimes you can get burnt as well yeah yeah so um i guess you know without naming any names but like i'm just curious about like what was what were some of the the downsides so when you're getting burnt like what 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 did that look like Uh, it's not so much getting it's not so much the downsides of it like you do look at it as have as having a close relationship with someone and for them it's same thing you can't take it to heart you can't take a lot of things to heart because that's just them in their time and place and they just have to do what they have to do. Um, you sort of think that everything's going to last forever, but it's not. Yeah. You know, so there is a time and place where you have fun with, with, with the team that you're working with, everything's going good, and then obviously something just happens and it just falls down, so you have to rebuild again. Yeah. So it's not, it's not so much getting burned, it's just the process of rebuilding again, going through the same process again and all that. Yeah, it's funny... Um you know, when you when you reflect back on it, though, you, the, you always have this fondness for some of the great teams that you built or great teams that you've been a part of. Because yeah. it's just like there's something special um, about being – and just like the Panthers, right? Like there's something yeah. special about being in that right team at the right time where everything is flowing. Absolutely. Right? And like the, when you when you reflect back on it, so when, I, when I think back on it, I was like, that's some of the fondest memories I have of that team environment. Yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. And it feels good. Like it's amazing. It's an amazing feeling when you're with the right team, when you're with the right crew, everything's gelling, everything's clicking. It's it's perfection, man. It's perfect. Yeah. You're happy. Yeah. So if only it could last forever. But then, <laughs> see, the thing is, like, nothing lasts forever because at the end of the day, once once that the 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 beauty of that team like settles down, then it's just like, oh, what's the next thing? Yeah. And then you try and do something, and then you you might end up breaking it, right? Like <laughs> it's just one of those things. It's like because you want to. You, uh, I always uh, I was saying this to to someone this morning on the phone it was like you know i have this uh habit of like you take on board you take something on and at the start it's difficult and then it becomes like normality and so it's like so then it's like okay now you add to this and you do the next thing and it's like at first it's difficult but it's like because you get used it's just like when you're training right you you train your body adapts and you that becomes the new baseline that's right so then you need to add more workload Mm -hmm. right and i always say you know your your capacity for earning is limited by your potential for problems that's right right so the more problems you can handle or well, the more capacity you have to make money right absolutely so you've got to be solving you know when you by the time you're solving really big problems well you deserve to have really big money <laughs> well you're constantly solving problems like there's always going to be something that's happening you're never yeah. going to just go streamline all the way up yeah you know everyone's going to say that's how business is it is how business is yeah but whether or not you can handle these problems and handle it at a quick rate mm. or, or get back up every time you get hit is a different story. That's how people stay in business. Yeah. You know, it's very, very hard. It's not easy. So, like, what was your wife saying when you're doing these two, two you're working basically? I wasn't with her at the time. Okay. I met her at UFC, to be honest. Okay, yeah. okay. I was going to say, because you were doing like, yeah, that's some big hours. Man. Yeah, yeah. Now I met her at UFC. So we, we met at UFC at the time. She was starting to be off a of PT. Yeah. Um, same thing. We all, I was doing development, helped her pick up a PT business. She picked it up quite quick. And then... 
two th- one thing led to another, and then obviously we ended up together. That's nice. Yeah, that's nice. It was a nice place. It was a nice place, nice time. That was a really good time in my life as well, too, where everything was running smooth. Yeah. And so then, what happened after after that? So after UFC gym, is that when this place you started to think about this place? Uh, so long story short, with UFC, uh, me and my business partner. So I've got a business partner. Shout out to Top. Top is my business partner. Um, I think we'll try probably add his IG or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll put <laughs> in the links. Yep. Yeah. Um, so myself and my business partner, Top, I was I got promoted to the national fitness director role at UFC. Okay. So what that entails is is that every time that they open up a club, we would pick a set amount of trainers. Yep. And I would have to build them up to be personal trainers and build up, help them build up their business from um, in within eight weeks. Yep. And my business partner, Top, he's he's the striking coach. So he would teach them all of the basics with boxing, kickboxing, and how to be a boxing trainer, mm. how to be a kickboxing trainer, and give them all the tools for that side of the, the industry. Yep. Um, and that's how we worked well together. We worked really good together. We found out that we could excel and, and, and make people great at quite a short time. Mm-hmm. And for us to go to each club um, at the time, you'd let's say one would open at like, one for example now you got Rockdale you got Blacktown you had one in Melbourne mm. we would get sent out to all of these clubs to help um, develop all of these trainers first so that the club was up and running and then we'd move on to the next one yep but as as a lot of businesses and everything go you don't obviously get what you want or they don't they don't pay you for what you're really good at mm. um, and we weren't well respected there at the time like after we obviously um, scaled up and myself and my business partner just decided it's time to it's time to open up our own thing. Yeah. And lo and behold, here we are and we're just down the road. <laughs> wow. Okay. So then um, when it came to like deciding where you guys are going to open up, you know, the name, all that sort of stuff, like had to talk me through. How did it all come yeah, together? Yeah, I want to I understand the genesis um, of it. Well, this was the first place we actually looked at first, but then we ventured off, obviously, looking into other places as well too. As for the name itself, Box Class derives from my business partner, and we kept it pretty standard, to be honest. Like yeah. it's, it wasn't a hard sell. He was, he was great at boxing, and we were, we know we wanted to create a, a boxing model, mm. and he just created the name Box Class because it's boxing class, uh, boxing, and we were doing classes, and Box Class was a hit like yep. the name is is pretty self-explanatory yeah you know, what you're delivering is is pretty self-explanatory we didn't need to venture off into that into anything else mm. yeah we we were good at boxing and we wanted to do classes and anything else that derives from the box class tree was just a just an offset you know there was it was a bonus like your kickboxing your metcon training yeah um they're doing wrestling now as well too. Yep. So all of these things was just an offset of the product, but the forefront product was box class. Yeah. Um, and yeah, funny story that this was the first place that we actually looked at at the time. Um, it was an event space. Yep. It was awesome. Um, but at the time they were just opening up their, their event space at the time. So it wasn't, it wasn't available. Oh wow. So it did take us about a year. We were looking into places and same thing. You just get yourself chucked into the deep end. You don't even know what the process is of looking at, looking at places to open up like you got to look at how long your how long your rent's going to be how much is it going to cost then you look at all of these factors da approval council all these things like all of these things you need to take into consideration as well too mm. um, and it was very hard it was very hard to find an actual place and i first time i saw this place i was like this is it man like the space looks amazing and we need to have this place and from that time after a year, the, this space ended up being available and we just jumped on it straight away. Wow. Yeah. I, can't, I, can't, I, can, I can sort of picture why, you know, it was an event space before, you know, with the, with the cutout hole. Yeah. You know, like, but like it's so perfect. Yeah, it is perfect. So what they did was with this event space, they cut out the piece of the roof yep. and that's why it's, it's pretty much like your, your sunroof and yeah. all the natural light shines onto the boxing ring. Yeah. And my partner is great at building things and he has a keen eye for making things and making things look great. And he was the one who physically built this place with his hands along with all the other trainers. Sam is our longest serving trainer here as well too. He's mm-hmm. been here since we started as well. Yeah. So we've got a good relationship there. But that's, that's really how the space is. It was already set up to be what it is. We, just only, we only needed to um, make a, minor, a few minor changes. Yep. Yeah. And, and so 
when it came to like you know uh, launching the business and all that sort of stuff did you have ideas in terms of how you wanted to kick it off um we did have an idea um we we did have an idea of how we wanted our brand to be and we wanted it to look high-end at the start and no matter like even if we didn't have that much equipment or anything we really always focused on the marketing side of things the black and white um the industry um the industry type of look in the the warehouse type of look with the with the boxing ring so you You've, set in, you've stepped into heaps of places with boxing rings, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen a boxing ring like how box class looks now? Yeah. No. Yeah, so like it's that old school type of feel and we wanted people to come here to train. Yeah. That's what we wanted it to feel like. Um, and when you walked in here, we wanted it to still look, feel like a high-end facility while you were training as well too. Yeah. So we stayed true to that marketing type of feel, the black and white. And I still stay true to that type of feel now when it comes to my marketing. Mm. Um, but the process of as to how you feel when you walk in, that's another process to talk about as well too. Yeah. yeah. So then, um, you know, when it came to like, you know, onboarding staff and all that sort of stuff, like did you have like um, guidelines in terms of like, you know, what, how you want them to sort of present themselves or that sort um, of stuff? No, not really, man. As you know, from my background, I was great at, at, um, at developing personal trainers. So it was very easy to build a crew to move over here. Yeah. So we started with a group of, a, of about five people mm. and everyone had their own client base. We were well known at that other gym down there yeah. as well too. So it was naturally everyone's going to gravitate towards here. It didn't get you in trouble at all? Uh, no, because no, we didn't have any contracts. So okay. you couldn't really do anything really. So oh, yeah, go. yeah. So that was one thing. You, we didn't have any contracts. You couldn't really do anything. And um. As we were speaking about before with one of the boys, I mean, what's 100 members going to a commercial gym? It's not, it's not that much. Mm. You know, whereas all we needed was 100 members to 150 members to start up. Yep. And we, I built that base. I premeditated everything before I started. Um, I made sure that I collected in a certain amount of leads and, and we focused a lot on the grand opening and all that type of stuff to make it huge to what it is today. Yeah. And then h- how did it, um, the second location that's meeting, like, how did that come about then? Funny story, that was, a, that was actually a franchise. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, funny story. That was actually a franchise. So that, that came up after a year of, of trading here at Box Class. And we, we actually weren't fully developed at the time here as well too. So as you see the place now, we've got obviously this space here and we've got the weights upstairs. We didn't have that at the time. Okay. All we had was downstairs. Wow. Yeah, and we didn't even have the reception area. Oh, really? So literally people would come through that garage door now and... That would be open all day, yep. but we'd close at about 10, 1030. Yep. And it would just literally be a, the boxing bags here on the side, the Metcon area, and a couple of bits of um, weight training equipment. That's literally what the space looked like mm. yeah, at the time. Um, but yeah, my business partner had, um, had friends or associates that wanted to buy into the, the franchise. Um, and at the time, it was a good idea, but... You know, you know how it is when it comes to franchises. When people start seeing that um, you have to pay for things, there's certain things that are involved in franchising, it, it just becomes ugly. Yeah. Yeah, it becomes ugly. But we took over the process of that and um, we came out good. Oh, wow. Yeah, we came out so, good. So originally you had guys that wanted to franchise it and, and move into that space yeah. and do that and then they were like, oh, this is difficult or they just didn't like the... Uh, look, Didn't gel. Didn't not, gel. I don't really want to obviously yeah, go into. Course, the, yeah, course, yeah, I don't. I don't want to go into obviously the background information of it. Yeah, Pretty of much, what we had to do was we had to go back in, take over the franchise, start from ground zero again, yep. build ourselves back up for another year or two. Yep. And man, once again, great trainers. Jerome, shout out to Jerome. He's our longest serving trainer over there. He stuck with us since the start. Zaya, same same bloke. Thank you. Those two guys were quite vital in helping that gym grow and building that community. Yep. They stuck it out with us for the start because I, would, I had to be in between both gyms and same as my business partner. Mm. And to build a community and a sense of um, a, great, a great environment for people in that area by yourself or to be there on a loose leash by yourself so for them to figure it out, man, I'm forever grateful for them to be by my side. Um, and that was very, very hard at the time. That was during the second COVID. Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah, yeah, that was during the second COVID, and you can imagine, this place had to close up, that place had to close up. You had to pay two rent at both facilities as well too. Yeah, and yeah, still had to fend for your family as well too at the time. Like, people don't realize, man, we were the first place. To, fitness was the first place to close up. Yeah, and yeah. it was hard. It wasn't easy. Yeah, and like that would have put a, a massive strain. Oh, know. huge, huge, huge! It put a massive strain on us mentally. But once again, if you got the vision and if you got 
you got the same drive and you and you keep that same energy all the way through you'll come out on top mm. and like i always say with the saying is if you do good towards people and you do good things you're always going to come out on top mm. and that's just that's always just uh you can see from our product over there now and how it's building up we've got good people there we come from good backgrounds good people we we deliver a good service good things always come back to us at the end mm. have out of curiosity like have other um Jim's, you know, approached you and be like, oh, you know, Aaron, what are you doing? You know, can you can you help us a little? Like, yeah, I'd be surprised. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, right? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people do ask, and I'm I'm happily happily like I will happily give them information out and yeah. help them. I'll yeah. take the time to sit down with them because I know how hard it is. Mm. Um, there's a lot of people that don't want to give that information out, but why? You know, why, why do you want them to go figure it out, figure it out themselves? I would happily give information out to someone who asks, okay, how do you? How do you build a gym? How do you do it this way? How do you do it that way? Because I had to go through all of the process of all the failures and keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. But if I can help this person build up what his dream is, then I've done good towards that person. Mm. They're never going to be competition to me because I believe in my own product. Mm. doesn't matter if you do a boxing gym next to me as well too. I've got my own product. I know what we're great at. I know what we're good at. And I know what you're going to be good at. I'm happy that you're next door because you just drives me to work harder anyway yeah 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 it's a good way to look at competition at the end of the day it's one of those ones where it's like um it does push you to make sure that you're happy with the product that you're providing right yeah yeah man yeah. absolutely yeah. a lot of people a lot of people view it in a negative light but it's like try try try, try being in the car industry where there's dealerships everywhere yeah right? exactly <laughs> exactly you got a car dealership every every corner man yeah I don't even understand how a lot of them make money, man. <laughs> well, like Australia is one of those ones where it's like one of the most contested marketplaces. Like we sell maybe oh, like a annually, it's like a million cars. It's crazy, man. 70 brands, you know, operating in the space, you know, all the Chinese entrants and all that sort of stuff. And it yep. was, so it's like for a lot of the brands, like they can't survive on their own. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but then at the same time, it's like, yeah, like competition then forces you as a business, if, you, if you're a business owner or a manager, like you have to continually refine what you're doing. That's right. You know, um, and, and also, you know, you got to do, spend, spend the time on acquisition and spend the time on, on creating that loyalty um, within your own database and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Yeah. It takes time. It takes time. You, and, and to be honest, if you don't spend enough time in the industry, then you won't figure these things out. Mm. You, won't, you won't build the resilience as well too. If you're not going to take time to, to learn your craft as well too, you're not going to build enough resilience to be better. Yeah. And, and that's what it is. It's time. It's funny. Um, so how, how long's uh, Box Class been around now? Five? This place is six years now. Six years. So we just re-signed our lease here for the, for the five. Yeah, six years. Six years. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you, you pretty much did like a 10-year apprenticeship of like, you know, when you think about <laughs> it, like when you started to um, at Fitness First yeah. to, to the point of like actually then starting, you know, this place. Absolutely. And then it's... Yeah, like, a, and, and that's the thing, like, people would come in and they'd look at this place and they go, oh, wow, look what you built. Yeah. But if it's their first time coming into the joint, they're like, oh, you know, how long have you guys been around? And it's like, they don't That's exactly what see they ask. Yeah. All the hard work that goes behind the scenes to get you to that point of Absolutely. what you've actually built. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm forever grateful for all the lessons that I've learned and whatever I've been through those past 10 years. And to be honest, we're actually only picking up strides now. Yeah. Like, like I said, people don't see it or take into account the past two COVIDs mm. as well. So you'd have to rebuild yourself. Like building a business at that time and to rebuild yourself twice, mm. like it's not easy. It's not easy. And for us to only start picking up strides now and once again, for me to get it as a, as a business person as well too, to, to look at bits and pieces and to see where I could do better as a business person, but also look at my vision and what I want in my life um, – these things aren't easy, but you 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 find ways to make it happen. Yeah. So out, out of curiosity, you know, like from doing you know all those massive hours, uh, being a PT and all that, to what life looks like for you now. Like okay. what, what do you focus on? I guess you know what are you what is sort of like your your day? What does your day sort of look like now? I'm very blessed. I'm very blessed to have, have to see my vision out because what I wanted when I first started was I wanted to be in a place where. I can work my own hours and work my own time. And obviously being your own business owner, you're working all day. Mm. Opening up in the morning here, closing at night. These are 16 hour days, long days. You're staying here. You're doing your head in <laughs> as well too, just sitting here thinking about how you're going to get clients into the, into the door. But as for now, it's five years down the line. I don't, I don't, I don't have too much stressful hours. I'd literally work about 20, 25 hours a week. 
and and the rest of the time I spend with either looking after my kids. I give my wife that time to obviously do things herself as well too, mm. and I have that space and freedom to have time to myself as well because that's what you need, right? You need that time and space to be fresh for other people or fresh for your business. And remember that time you were saying when you're in the when you're in the factory, you just need that break and you need that time to to resettle your head. Mm. This is that's that time I give to myself now. Yeah, you know, whereas I thought that giving myself that time was was not allowed. Yeah, like I couldn't do it. If I, if I did do it, I'd feel bad. Whereas now, I take the time to give myself whatever, whatever I want to do. So for whatever I want to do, I'll do it for myself and for myself only because I know it's going to benefit the gym or benefit my business or benefit my family. Yeah. It's uh, the old adage of uh, consistency versus intensity. That's it. You know, if you're going to operate and work yourself to the bone at 120%, you know, you got to be prepared for that moment when, you, when your body like goes, hey, yeah, I've had absolutely. enough. And then you now need this massive amount of downtime. Whereas if absolutely, you man. are more focused and balanced in terms of your approach, like that same thing, like what I do with the podcast, right? Like I just try and do one a week and it's just that way. It's like, okay, I can do this indefinitely. Yep. Yep. Right. And then the results, they are what they are. Like I don't really focus on that, but it's like, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. You know? And if you're happy to do that, then that's all that really matters. Mm. It's it shows, not what shows, any, shows in the product, right? Yeah. It's not really what anyone else thinks because this is your product and this is who you are yeah. and this is how you want things to be. And if you're doing it your way and you're doing it how you want and how you played it out to be, then I'm, I'm here clapping for you, man, because <laughs> this is what you wanted to do. So um, when it comes to uh, – it's more of a, a question as a dad, right, because we're both dads. Um, when it comes to how what the kind of dad you want to be for your kids, like what, how do you sort of um, uh, balance that with them and or like how do you sort of like educate them? Because the thing that I would say is that our, our kids are so blessed because uh, – they have so much more than what we had growing up. Yep. Right? And so it's a difficult one, but like I always struggle with this line of like, okay, how do you know you've, give, you've, you've given them enough versus you've given them too much? Yeah, yeah. Look, I always ponder if I'm, if I'm being a good father or not, but at the end of the day, if, if you look at things, what they want is time. Mm. They want time and they want presence as well too. If you're present in the moment with them, then you're really giving them what they actually want and what they actually deserve mm. because... Me growing up, I never got time from my father or neither did I have presence from them. Mm. And knowing that now that I can give them both of those things um, as well as fixing myself as to be emotionally intelligent for my family, not only for my kids but for my partner as well too and trying to be a stable rock for them, then I'm giving my family what they need because I didn't get that growing up. And if you're working, if I, that's my number one goal in life that I can ultimately be this stable rock. Look, who's saying that I'm not one now, but if I continue to be this stable rock for them and to show them that I can create more time for them and be more present with them and allow more freedom for them, then I'm ultimately giving my family what they want. Mm. You know, you can work as much hours as you want you can, and you can be away from home, but what truly is close to my heart is being with my family, being with my kids, being with my wife all the time and knowing that I can do that whenever I want. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want time to get a hold of me. I'm never going to get that back. Yeah. Right. And if I can always say I have time, then my kids are going to remember that. My kids are always going to remember that. I was always home. I always had time for them. Not like, oh, I'm busy working. Or dad was always working. He had overtime. He had this, he had that. Um, it doesn't matter what they achieve in life. But if I'm always there to support them, give them what they need, then I'm going to be I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I, was ha uh, I always think about this where it's like, you know, when, when we're young, you know, we're always in a rush. You know, we want to we wanna get to here. We want to achieve this. We want to do that. And like we're always in this rush. And it's like when you actually think about it, like what is the end destination for us all? We end, yeah. up, we end up in the dirt, right? Like I, I think about it all the time. And what did our parents do when we were growing up? Yeah. You know, hurry up. Do this. Do that. Hurry up. And I, I'm... I'm I'm a big thing in that as well too because I I do I find myself I kind of have to catch myself because I do that as well too like yeah. what, why are we rushing them, you know what I mean? Why are we telling them to hurry up to tie their shoelaces up? Why are we telling them to hurry up to get into the car? <laughs> like we just get annoyed at these little things like and if you look at it from a different perspective that man they're just little human beings, and you're rushing them you can actually cause problems for them down the line by rushing them. Yeah, they get anxious. You know? They get anxious, 
And that's probably why we, we are a little bit anxious sometimes as well, <laughs> you know. And because and social media is more available, it tells you as to why some people feel anxious. And you can see these things, and it's right. Yeah. Like rushing people, um, you can't rush perfection. You can't rush, you can't rush being into the future of your life as well too. You can only be present in what you are now in this moment in time. You can't, you can't change that. Yeah. You know, if your heads are always always rushing and it's always ahead of time, then what's the point in being sitting right here now? Yeah, taking a moment. Yeah. Reflecting. I'm taking time to listen to you. Um, I'm taking, whereas before, my wife would always tell me that I don't, I don't slow down when, when I'm listening to someone or if you're asking me a question, I'd always try to cut in. And I really took that into consideration today that I do have to listen. I do have to take the time to listen to your words and what you're saying, you know. Um, and that was learnt because growing up, my parents would always cut me off as well. And that's a learnt habit, yeah. you know. So if I can, if I can change all of these things and, and teach these to my kids, then I'm happy. We're just trying to teach them, give them the tools that they need. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy thing when you think about it. Like, you know, um, kids growing up, even as, as people, like, you know, we, we're, we're consistently growing until yeah. the point that we're consistently dying. Absolutely. Right? Like, <laughs> you're, you're either growing or you're dying. It's either or. Like, That's you could say that we're rushing, yeah. we're rushing towards dying or, are, like, are we living or are we dying? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So. And then what are, we, what are we going to do when we're, like, 60, 70 years old? We'll look back and just, like, man, what did I end up doing? Mm. I was rushing the whole time. I didn't get to spend time with my kids. I missed out on X, Y, Z. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a trap. Yeah, it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, I think that's a beautiful way for us to, to sort of wrap this up. So if people want to find you, give all the socials a plug. What do what we got? We got Coach Azza. Coach, Coach Azza, Azza yep. um, Box Class AU, and you got Top Spiosovic on the – yeah. <laughs> I'll, 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 put it, I'll put it down the bottom. And then there's two locations. So there's obviously uh, Smithfield. Smithfield and Smith and Grange. Smith and Grange. And guys, this place is opening up very soon too. It's called Bliss Pilates. Look them up on Instagram, Sydney Bliss. And we've got one more thing coming into the pipeline, so stay tuned. Okay, and then we've got another event. Yeah, December 15, guys. I'd love to see you there. The man on the mic is commentating as well too. He brought some awesome energy that day. So December 15, we're running another fight camp. We've got five other gyms involved as well too. And I can't wait. I can't wait for that event, eh? Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah. Fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, man. It's a pleasure.